The Thing is a much beloved movie, and not least because of its amazing practical effects made by SFX whiz kid Rob Bettine. At only 23 years old, Bettine created what are perhaps some of the most memorable practical effects of all time. John Carpenter's film is a tense whodunit, or rather who is it, as the occupants of a research station in Antarctica are invaded by a hostile shape-shifting alien thing that, body snatchers style, replicates its victims and infiltrates the yet to be assimilated. The film is iconic, not only for its tense plot and minimalist soundtrack, but also for the terrifying forms of the thing itself. This video is a companion to another video where I look at Rob Bettine's career as a whole and at his seemingly abrupt exit from the industry. Here I'm specifically looking at Bettine's work on The Thing, a film that he worked on for a year, he slept on the set of, and he worked so hard on he had to be treated for exhaustion after. Now The Thing's effects, I think, remain so good because of their tangibility. Real models had to be used, things had to work, they had to be able to exist. I've heard people say that they don't hold up. Well, I think that the models in the thing hold up really well. Yes, they're dated, and they're not going to be as gobsmacking as they were in 1982, but it's their practical nature, I think, makes them hold up so well. I can suspend my disbelief and think that that spider thing <coughs> exists and is in the crawl space of something. The Thing has aged a lot better in 35 years than I Am Legend has in 10. Bettine petitioned Carpenter to allow him to play a creepy character in Carpenter's 1980 film The Fog, which Bettine ended up doing the SFX makeup for and playing Blake in. So I got to work with him and I was very happy and we had a good working relationship and really had a lot of similar uh, interests and things. And he said, guess what? He goes, I'm going to do a movie called The Thing, you know. And I said, you're kidding me, you're going to remake The Thing? And he said, yeah. He says, that's the idea. You know, and he says, I want you to make The Thing. Right, and I went, oh my God, this is fantastic, you know. He and Carpenter ended up getting along. And after The Howling, Carpenter knew that Bettine was right for The Thing. The film had a notoriously brutal shoot. The sets were refrigerated and humidified to create the atmosphere that Carpenter deemed necessary. It took three months to film in studio and an additional two weeks to film in location in British Columbia. But the special effects work took Bettine over a year of seven-day weeks. Often, he slept on the set or in his workshop. Carpenter, by his own admission, wasn't very experienced in studio filming, having come from low-budget filmmaking. The makeup effects budget for The Thing was $750,000. By the end of production, that had doubled. Bettine said that he wanted to make the thing, the actual thing, the monster, never look the same twice. No doubt adding to the idea of the power of the shape-shifting alien, but also no doubt adding tremendously to his workload. Now although Bettine did no doubt work directly on many of the models, sculpting some of the more famous pieces, his real importance to the thing was as a supervisor. I'm basically a special effects supervisor, you know, and the designer. What I do is I'm in charge of 35 people and I have different department heads for the different areas that I work with. I work with illustrators, I work with mold makers, I work with sculptors, I work with uh, sketch artists, I work with uh, spe mechanical special effects guys. And basically what I do is go around and try to feed them each ideas, um, you know, and using, you know, sketches and things like that and working out exactly what we want to see on screen with uh, these very talented people. Not to mention all the work he did with Mike Plug, a storyboard artist, to get all those SFX into a narrative form. Bettine's team used hydraulics, pneumatics and pull wires within a puppet skeleton or frame to create the creature's movement. They used mayonnaise or cream corn for eyeballs, heated bubblegum, strawberry jam, mayonnaise, gelatin, and food thickener for the gore and the goo we see dripping off some of the monsters. My stomach's starting to have mixed feelings about Bettine's work. Oh wait, here's a remedy. Like a crazy person, Bettine wanted to use real animal organs for some of the creature's parts. Delicious. However, the team ended up using a lot of foam rubber and other substitutes after a box of offal was left on a soundstage and stank up the set 
The Blair monster in the film's finale required 300 pounds of foam rubber alone and 63 technicians to operate. Much of its appearance was cut because the stop motion sequence made by Ernie Farino wasn't deemed congruent with the rest of the film by Carpenter. At the time, the film was reckoned by people who worked on it to be the biggest black hole for foam latex ever. The mechanical team responsible for moving foam skins, or sculptures, went through dozens of skins of Norris's head. What about one of the most famous scenes, where Dr. Copper gets his hands bitten off? Well, Charles Hallahan, who plays Norris, the guy on the slab, spent 10 days with Bertine's team, getting his head and limbs molded, and a fiberglass mold of his body shaped and created. Hallahan was inside the operating table itself, with only his arms, shoulders, and head exposed. The rest was a body sculpted on and over him. The chest really does open up, and it really does bite the arms of Dr. Copper, played by Richard Dysart. Those teeth really did chop into those arms with a hydraulic mechanism. It's just the arms weren't real. They were made from gelatin and lined with blood-filled rubber veins and wax bones, and were attached to a double amputee. That's why I love practical effects so much. Okay, the arms weren't real, but the action was real. The double amputee the team used wore a mask of Dysart, so the audience never knew that it was a double. Of course, it was never that easy. It came out and it just looked like there should be showgirls dancing out of his stomach and stuff. And John goes, cut! Thank you very much, Mr. Boteen. You know, like that, he goes, what happened? You know, he goes, that was horrible. You know, like that, he goes, it looked like a fountain in Las Vegas, right? And, and you know, Charlie's going like, Wait a minute, you know, do we got to do this all over again? Yeah, look, and I go, ah, yeah, Charlie, I'm really sorry. And John goes, wait a minute, what do you mean? And I go, well, the stomach ripped open. You know, we got to, you know, take this all apart and put a whole new one on. And John goes, we got to do this tonight. You know, and I'm going like, oh my God, you know. Norris's head hanging off the desk was achieved with a latex model head attached to melted plastic and gum, which allowed flexibility while retaining some rigidity. On the shot where we see Norris's head with the flames at the bottom of the frame, this particular effect was achieved only after a minor explosion on set. Right, he goes, all right, light the fire bar. Guy turns on the gas. Pshhh. You know, stuff's coming out. And the guy's up there with a, with a you know, like a, a, a lighter. You know, and he's... Tch, tch, tch. And finally, it ignites, right? And the whole effect, the whole Hallahan, you know, replica body explodes. I look down at it and I go, oh my God, it's on fire, right? It's on fire. And then John says, don't just stand there, put it out, you idiot. As you can tell, it was a laborious task, with resets taking hours and hours, and no doubt many days spent on ideas that just didn't work. But Carpenter was determined that his film would stand out and look different. He and Bettine achieved that through hard work and the spirit of adventure although I'm sure it's something they needed a break from after it was all over. Stan Winston was brought in to create the dog creature as Bottin was so overworked, and his creation fits in really well with the rest of the movie. The Thing doesn't just pioneer the technical side of special effects. Sure, methods of puppeting and gooifying things came out of the process, but more importantly, it showed just what could be accomplished. Norris's head on an elongated neck is real in the sense that it isn't stop motion or animation. It's a live effect, and it's an impressive creation, not only in terms of practicality, but in imaginative conjuring. Well, that's about it for this look at The Thing's effects. I think that the effects in The Thing hold up really well, and are more believable and convincing than many of the effects coming out today. But what do you guys think? Do you agree with that, or am I just living in nostalgia land? Don't forget to subscribe and like, and join me next time where I'll be discussing the use and evolution of stop motion in the film industry. See you next time.